All right, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the next uh, installment of our Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, today it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. John Scott, who will be our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Scott received his Master's in Clinical uh, Psychology at George Mason, that's right, Clinical Psychology at George Mason University. His PhD in I.O. from uh, IIT. Uh, Following that, he worked for five years uh, at HR Strategies, which uh, you may know from the book uh, Million Dollar Hire. The author of that book was the, the uh, founder of uh, HR Strategies, and John worked there for five years uh, before uh, splitting off and starting his own company. Um, he is a COO and co-founder of APT Metrics, where he has been for the last 25 years. Um, and you'll, I don't think he'll mention any clients today, but you can talk with him afterwards and, and you'll see that uh, the client list that he works with is incredibly impressive. Uh, he's also uh, heavily involved, as you know, or as you probably know, in PSYOP um, and in, in various IO uh, publishing practices. Uh, this includes being the co-editor for the Handbook of Workplace Assessment, um, subtitle Evidence-Based Practices for Selection and Developing Organizational Talent. He's also the co-editor, I think, on a forthcoming book, or maybe it's already no, come it's out. out. I it's mean, out people should have it. They would know that. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> next generation technology enhanced uh, assessment, global perspectives on occupational and workplace testing. He's a PSYOP fellow. He's an APA fellow. Uh, he was the PSYOP uh, senior representative at the United Nations uh, and was instrumental in getting uh, PSYOP, I won't have the right term, uh, NGO. as an Social NGO uh, with, with the UN, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, he has uh, won a number of PSYOP awards, uh, including the Humanitarian Award, the Award for Distinguished Service, and uh, most recently, and this is super top secret information, not allowed to be released until January of 2020, he is also uh, the PSYOP recipient of the uh, Award for Distinguished Professional Contributions for this coming year. And lastly, I'll mention that he's also the uh, Editor-in-Chief at Industrial and Organizational Psychology Perspectives on Science and Practice, which is a journal I know we're all familiar with. So um, it is really an honor to have him visiting us, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy his presentation, and we should be talking about some really cool uh, a simulation methodology that they're using at APT Metrics now, and I hope you stick around afterwards uh, to, to chat with him more about it. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Scott. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you'll see in front of you a, a uh, booklet that Sherm had uh, requisitioned from us to write up on selecting 21st century leaders. Uh, we did that, I think it was a year ago. I co-authored it with Alan Church and uh, um, Jillian McLellan from ABT Metrics. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is included in that in terms of some of the charts and graphs and, and the actual notes behind some of these graphs that I'm going to put up. Uh, I'm somewhat of a believer in not going into death by PowerPoint, and so I've got charts here that don't really have many words on them. So the notes, will you, you'll find a lot of the notes right here in, in, this, uh, in this booklet, the Sherm booklet. So I'm going to talk today about why we conduct leadership assessments in the first place. Uh, I'll go into a, a bit on talent segmentation, developing an assessment framework for the 21st century, and how we predict leadership potential. So the first issue is that the statistics around leadership failure are pretty well established by now, with estimates ranging up to 50% within the first 18 months of taking on a new position. And I've seen numbers in studies that have actually gone higher than this. And this doesn't even account for leaders who are maybe not failing, but not quite as successful as they were predicted to be during the hiring and promotion phase. So the question is, why is this happening? Why are we seeing these staggering rates of leadership failure? And some popular notions are that, well, these leaders are not able to adequately assess and adapt to the unique demands of the new environment. And when you have leaders who can't transfer or generalize their, their skills to, a, to an environment that's different from the one in which they were developed, well, they're not gonna get traction, right? And that's a plausible excuse, I guess. But a more compelling argument is that these leaders were not properly assessed in the first place. 
<laughs> what's the rock and the, the hand of the rock? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that the skills that got these folks promoted are not the skills necessary for effective leadership. And as, as we affectionately come to know these as emergent leaders, uh, they're probably great bartenders at the Christmas party, but they're not going to be effective leaders of the organization. And so the challenge for us is how do we differentiate these emergent leaders who are so capable of getting themselves promoted from the effective leaders who can really take on the broader leadership roles? And this issue becomes much more urgent when you consider the 21st century workplace and the challenges that leaders today are having to face from globalization, shifting business models, significant advances in technology, rapid speed of organizational change, unpredictability. The need for effective leaders is more urgent now than ever before. And so as these disruptive changes sweep across our organizations, we need to step back and really rethink how we are assessing, selecting, developing, and retaining our high potential leaders particularly as we confront the 21st century workplace and the speed of organizational change. Now, in an interesting study DDI did in uh, 2018 as part of their global leadership forecast, they surveyed 1,000 C-level executives from around the world and found that only 14% of those CEOs that were included in the study believed that they had the leadership talent necessary to execute on their business strategy. This is despite the fact that organizations globally spend over $50 billion a year on leadership development. And despite this spend, organizations are not feeling like they've got the bench strength necessary to execute their business strategy. Now when the same group of leaders were asked to select from a set of 28 challenges that would most be vying for their attention, and, and these were global challenges like uh, recession, political instability, terrorism, climate change, cybersecurity threats. The two challenges that bubbled to the top consistently were developing next generation leaders and attracting and retaining top talent. And as assessment professionals in this room, this is clearly well within our wheelhouse, right? We can address this, we can, we can drive these solutions for these C-level executives. And whether you're talking about developing next generation leaders from within the organization or attracting and retaining top talent from outside the organization, what we bring to the table is an integrated assessment strategy that allows us to identify those future superstars, those future effective leaders, right? We also need to ensure that we can help organizations segment their talent populations so that they find the right leaders for the right roles and provide the right kind of developmental feedback for meaningful action. And the need to segment talent derives from beyond just the fact that we've got these staggering leadership failure rates. It's also the fact that job performance and by extension leadership potential is not normally distributed into a nice bell-shaped curve like we sometimes like to think it is. And in fact, in a recent study done by Ernest O'Boyle and Herman Aguinas, a couple of researchers in our field, they looked at five distinct industries, a number of different jobs, a number of different performance types, uh, performance measures, covering over 600,000 cases. And what they found is that the distribution of individual performance is such that most people fall into the lowest end of the distribution, as represented by this red Pareto distribution. This is also sometimes known as the law of the vital few, or the 80-20 rule, which says basically that 20% of your talent in your organization is responsible for 80% of the productivity. And what these researchers recommended is that we as assessment professionals identify assessment tools that can, that can identify that elite cohort, those effective leaders, rather than wasting our time on trying to identify and differentiate individuals who are not in that elite group. Now this can be looked at another way. When you think about how organizations allocate their resources, their precious developmental resources, without segmentation, organizations have a tendency to, to distribute their resources across all levels, all the top levels in, in uh, the organization. However, with talent segmentation, 
organizations are able to allocate their resources to those individuals who will be responsible for the majority of the productivity and those future elite leaders. So what's the holy grail here? How do we identify those individuals along that slide on the pyramid who will be responsible for the majority of productivity and be leading the organization and, and deep into the organization to identify the hypos? Talent segmentation is a critical strategic imperative for organizations and again, something that we in this room can easily handle. It's in our wheelhouse. So, when I ask groups when I'm presenting on this, what would best identify this set of individuals along this slide on the pyramid, the high performers, the individuals responsible for productivity, the future leaders. What I most frequently hear, cognitive ability, native intelligence, crystalline, crystal fluid intelligence, right? But given that we've got 50% of the leaders who are failing in our organizations, I'm guessing most people here know leaders who have failed, is it cognitive ability that's the cause? Is that the problem? What is it? What is it? Oh, I, was, I just said that probably never is talking yeah. like, What is it? Personality, Personality characteristics, right? That's a great answer in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is look in the newspaper and see that native intelligence is significantly impacted by emotional dysfunction, right? <laughs> so. What do we do? How do we measure this group of folks to predict who is going to be the leaders of our organization? We need to have a, uh, an organization or a conceptual model against which to build our assessment program. And when organizations decide that they're going to segment their talent, in most cases, these organizations use some model of potential, right? And so we have to ask the question, then, Potential for what? What is potential? And in talent management, succession planning, we're generally operationalizing that as predicting who those effective leaders are going to be who can move to progressively higher levels in the organization, right? And so we still need to understand what are those what are those components of potential that we need to predict. <laughs> A couple of other consultants in our field, uh, who I'm sure most of you know, Rob Silzer and Alan Church. Uh, in an attempt to develop an integrated framework of potential, did a robust review of the literature, they, they looked at uh, large organizations and consulting firms, all of whom were working with different models of potential. And they ended up crystallizing three dimensions that cut across all definitions of potential. They, they, they uh, named this the Leadership Potential Blueprint. It describes the building blocks of leadership potential. And the, the three dimensions are the foundational dimensions, personality, cognitive ability, conceptual, strategic thinking, dealing with complexity, and personality. I'm probably not having to describe what that is here, but, but ultimately, how do, what, what's the individual's characteristic patterns of behavior? How do they behave under stress? What are their key drivers? What kind of a culture would they create as leaders? These are the things that we need to understand. These foundational dimensions obviously are stable over time. The next set of dimensions that they were looking at was learn, that, that they termed growth dimensions is learning and motivation. These are dimensions that can either facilitate or hinder one's development as an effective leader. Openness to learning, openness to feedback. Uh, learning agility gets tossed in there sometimes. Motivation, initiative, conscientiousness, career ambition. Does the individual want to be a leader? Can you folks see where the Hogan suite of assessments might apply to any of these? Maybe, right? We'll talk about that. And then the career dimensions are the essentially the leadership competencies, as well as the domain expertise. And so this is a nice conceptual model. It's great is a heuristic in explaining it to our organizational leaders when we're talking about building an assessment program where we identify leadership <coughs> potential. This has turned out to be a very nice way to explain that and, and, and it comes across, it seems to resonate very well. But it is still just a conceptual model. It's, it still needs to be adapted to one's organization. 
we need to understand, for example, what are the leadership competencies? How do we want to weight personality and cognitive ability in this model of, for our organization? So we have to do a job analysis, right? The, the most glamorous part of what we do. <laughs> The job analysis. We have to un before we can measure anything accurately. We have to understand what are the leadership demands. And in, in in predicting leadership potential, we're typically looking to predict individuals that can move up to a certain level in the organization. We're not looking at specific roles, predicting to specific roles. And we're looking all VPs, for example, as the target level. And so in that instance, competency modeling is very appropriate as a, as a way of conducting your job analysis. Once we understand the leadership demands, we, we link the competencies to those demands. We also link the competencies up to the organization's strategic objectives. We get the, the domain expertise, the other requirements. This gets us almost all the way there, but it doesn't get us completely there in developing our assessment specifications. Because if we really want to predict success, leadership success in the 21st century workplace, we have to understand these contextual variables. What's the business environment? What's the organizational structure? What's the organizational culture? And what are the strategic objectives? Because remember, when we think about what leaders today are dealing with, it's a very dynamic environment. I'm sure most of you have heard the term VUCA environment, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And whenever we're conducting leadership assessments in the context of this dynamic work environment, we need to expand our assessment perspective to account for these situational and contextual variables. And by business environment, I'm talking about what are the, the global, economic, market, competitive conditions that are confronting the organization and its leadership. What's the organizational structure look like? Is this a startup tech firm? Is it a multinational firm? Uh, what's the, the social and demographic makeup? And then what are the strategic objectives? To the extent that we study those and can incorporate those into our assessment program, allows us to expand our assessment perspective, create much more uh, robust assessment tools, and predict a much wider criterion space against this backdrop. And if we fail to do that, we're going to be missing a big piece of the picture, a significant chunk of predictable variance, and we're going to be standing there scratching our heads wondering why these leaders are passing our competency-based assessment, but they're failing at a 50% rate. Right? So this is critical to incorporate context into our leadership assessments. So how the heck do we do that? Well, if you look at some benchmarking data that was done recently on 100 large multinational firms, most of whom are ranked by Fortune Magazine as top companies for leaders, what you find is that those organizations use three assessment tools uh, to predict leadership potential. Interviews, 360s, and personality inventories. Now, we talked about the emergent leaders. We talked about the, the, the volatile uh, work environment that we've got here. I, I need to uh, question whether or not past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, and that's what interviews and 360s are, are going after, right? And even if past behavior is a reasonable predictor of future behavior, our emergent leaders can throw the diagnostic feelers off uh, certainly of interviews and, and also of, of three sources, <coughs> particularly the manager ratings, right? They're so skilled, they're socially skilled, they're networking, upward, you know, politicking, upward management. We, that, so you have to be careful there. So if you had no restrictions on your assessment tools, what would you use to predict the future? If you want to predict how somebody's going to behave in the future, what would you do? Create the future. <laughs> Create the future, drop your candidates into the future, throw all the business challenges at them, and see how they do, right? So, how do we create the future? Well, we do it during the job analysis. We work with organizational strategists whose job it is to direct the organization forward or leaders within. Uh, we sometimes work with thought leaders out of business schools who study these sectors to give us some idea of where is this organization, this sector heading? 
five, ten years out. They'll tell you they can predict ten years out. But regardless, we need to figure out where this organization is headed, and we need to incorporate the contextual variables into that vision of the future. We do this during the job analysis phase, and so we have now just made job analysis fun again. As if it wasn't fun before, I mean, but it's, it's still, we, we've made it fun, we've made it glamorous. Now, how do we take the, this virtual West world of an organization and throw our candidates into it? How do we assess business challenges in this future that, that I'm talking about? Well, thankfully, the technology that's out there has become so much more accessible the costs have come down so much that we can build these rich multimedia simulations to measure a vast array, an almost limitless array of leadership attributes. And if done correctly, the immersive nature of these simulations can create a, a, a sense of psychological involvement and sense of urgency to really engage these participants up and down the organizational structure from C-suite down to early candidate or early career individuals. So the idea here is to identify the future organization, build that future organization, put it into a simulation, put our candidates through that organization of the future and see how they do. And we're assessing them, remember, for leadership potential, we want to assess how they're going to do two to three levels higher or even higher in the organization, in the organization of the future. I'm going to show you an example here of a simulation that was done uh, for a selection process for first line leaders in a relief organization. Now this notion of the future isn't so salient in this particular demonstration because the future, this is the future, the tragedies and travesties that we see around the world that these individuals have to deal with. Uh, but this is going to give you an example of how you can build out a, a simulation to drop candidates in and, and see how they would do under these circumstances. Yes, Introduction to the individuals, their first day on the job, they get an introduction to the, this relief organization and, and get a sense of, of uh, what's happening there. Then we'll interrupt that with some other sorts of uh, uh, items that, that, that get them used to taking the test. Depending on how automatic you want this assessment to be, it can be multiple choice, it can be open ended, you can film the responses. Uh, but this is just to get them oriented to it. There will be emails, there's a toolbar at the top that they can deal with or that they will need to deal with in answering some of the questions. And in this case, they just got an email that says, are you sure you can hear that? It didn't sound like it was very loud. Can you hear it? We're loud, we hear it. Okay. Um, so in this case, uh, they just got an email that says, we were going to onboard you today, but instead what we need to do is get you out into the field. There's been another earthquake. You need to get your team together and get back out to the field. So then they get dropped right back into this. Luckily, 
only for the major cities, most of the damage was back the countryside. Our main problem is going to be the country roads. Well, roads. A lot of them are basically dirt roads to begin with. We need to know what state they're in, and we need to know what disaster relief supplies have gotten where. Anytime there's a break this bad, food insecurity becomes a real problem. Well, welcome to Film Face Echo. This is our big camp for operations along the border. Most of what we have here is on loan from the Tobacco Government Office of Disaster Management. So be polite. Hi! Good to see you. Good to see you too. There are a few representatives from the Tobacco Government staff. Most of the volunteers are locals. And then we've got a few of our own people here just to help keep it all together. Meet up. Meet up. Frank Mason, he's the original help for you. Listen to <coughs> Like Alright, we gotta change trucking companies. The last three shipments have all had bad refrigeration. Any supplies we get spoils before it even gets here. And with the new earthquake, things have gone from bad to worse. Right? That's getting us down. But it's really not even about the trucks. It's about the mountain road. Almost all the roads are blocked with rubble, okay? So tell Andrea what we need is a railroad crew, and we need the minister to start moving. And security. We need police presence. I know the volunteers have been stealing. Can you blame them? They have families in the villages. I mean, if we can't get the supplies up, what do we expect them to do? We'll talk to the minister. Jess is here to assess needs, so send everything you need to Jess Haley at Children First, and we'll take it from there. Welcome, Jess. It's actually really beautiful here, and so full of life. I hope you can come to realize that. Maybe you'll last longer than working at Sun. Don't get me started. Oh, my God. Let's just say the guy didn't do it more than any favors. Well, look, this job really isn't for everyone, so let's just move on. Jess, you're going to want to message Andrea and let him know that we made it here okay. I'm going to set a couple of meetings while you're doing that. Also, we're going to have to think about suspending vaccinations while we get the relief out. But don't put it in those words. Just tell Andrea what you see and let him make that call. So you can see how the context here serves to drive the simulation, present realistic kinds of business challenges, or challenges in this case, and then the individual will need to respond to those uh, as, as the um, simulation moves on. Uh, I'm gonna give you another one now. This is uh, from an electric utility organization, and we were able to envision this organization with the work of an organizational strategist and, and some thought leaders seven years out. In the future, electric utilities will treat you as human beings. <laughs> okay, I know it feels a little odd. Uh, we will also see uh, these organizations really thinking about business <coughs> and, and thinking in terms of investments in electric charging stations, right, up and down the East Coast and, and other ways that they can create a win-win scenario for their customers while also making money. Uh, there are also, in the future, in the electric utility uh, industry, um, issues of cybersecurity threats, other kinds of things that, that uh, they need to be aware of. So in this case, this is, uh, you were just hired as a CEO, and uh, it's not a popular decision. You're coming from the outside, and some internal folks thought that they were actually better for the job. And so you're gonna see, you're gonna have a little bit of political backstabbing going on as you're trying to go about learning who the team is, um, and also figuring out uh, what investments make sense for the organization and so on. Now, this particular one was built as a trailer. Sometimes when we're in uh, these organizations and have created these, they, they, the organization wants a trailer, like a movie trailer, so that they can create the buzz for their executives to see what they're going to be assessed on. Uh, and so that's what this is versus the last one. So this is more of a trailer. Viceroy Energy. Leading millions of Americans towards a brighter energy future. Viceroy Energy continues to be one of the future leaders in innovation and diversification. Breaking news in the energy sector today. Kay Warney will be Viceroy Energy's new chief executive for the power supply of energy. Only four months into the search for success. <laughs> Strategic initiatives, so it's not about opposition. Customer service is getting a little bit. The, the landscape is changing. It's a good idea. We're looking forward to finding a positive solution. Sex and trouble for a website. 
Are you back online? Still shut down. Perfect. How are you with my assistance? How are you with the phone? Put your heads together. Put your list. Imagine items. Shareholders are particularly thrilled. This is not speculation. We don't know how this affects profitability. It's too early to tell. We are a bedrock stock. I understand you have an all-hands town hall schedule. It was all a favor. Make it productive. I'm very excited to welcome everyone to our first CEO of Town Hall with Kaden Warden. Thank you. Gold? I always feel so anxious when that soon comes out. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to show you one more. I, can, I know you get the idea of the simulation, so I'm going to just show you one more. And the reason this next one made sense to me, there's, and it's another trailer, but um, there's a government shakedown. This is from a global um, retail um, organization that's trying to make <coughs> inroads into some different countries. And there's a bit of a shakedown uh, on the part of one of the governments, which is absolutely something that you see a lot. And some organizations that we know and love have gotten themselves into trouble for playing ball with these kinds of things. And so this is a, a challenge that a new CEO is going to have to deal with and others are going to have to deal with in an organization. So uh, again, it's a trailer, so you're not going to get a real sense of it, but I just at least wanted to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this, these uh, just demonstrate some of the other aspects to the simulation, the, the video, uh, uh, voicemails, uh, you've got all kinds of attachments, you got a regular email set up, so it looks and feels just like the job. That's what we attempt to do. And uh, here's the electric vehicle charging station investment piece that the, that the individual needs to study. There's other spreadsheets associated with it. And you've got people that are arguing for it, others arguing against it on your leadership team. And so you really need to come to some conclusions around what you're gonna do. And some of these are going to be constructed responses. You'll type it out. You could also be filmed uh, in terms of how you would respond. And certainly in that town hall meeting, you're gonna be filmed in how you would respond. So let me just show you this last one here. Rowan, welcome to Fowler. Rowan, glad you're here. Settle in later. You need to hit the ground running today. Welcome. When I started at Falder 13 years ago, I didn't understand how important the culture here is. Now I do. Uh -huh. And I have no qualms admitting that. A lot has changed at Falder over the years, but a lot remains the same. They've received a competitive bid. What? This is a rather interesting development caught on tape at the UI College radio broadcast this morning. A possible blow to Falgar's aggressive pursuit of world retail dominance. Talk about a priority shift. We can handle it. How can we handle it, Michelle? We deeply apologize. The timing caught us by surprise as well. This is what happens, Patricia. You know this. It's part of the game. But the perform firm could find a way to offset intangible losses. What was that? Well, I don't know what that was, but it certainly was interesting. And we're losing ground. We need this, and we need it now. Let's do this deal. Breaking news out of Central America today, where a new trade agreement with the United States... Have you seen this? You're being altruistic and naive, and you think this will work. The status quo is a losing proposition, Walter. We have an important status meeting in the morning, and I feel like I'm operating in a vacuum. I expect a lot from you. Don't let me down. So, that's an example of how these sims might work. And let's circle back to what we were originally talking about, which was the excessive leadership failure rate and the need to develop next generation leaders and attract and retain top talent. These are our C-suite priorities. This is not a simulation. <laughs> this is real. So what do we do? We, the idea here 
is to assemble a set of structured assessments that represent different perspectives and different data sources. And these different data sources are going to provide us with multiple methods for understanding the opportunities, the developmental needs of individuals, their strengths, and ultimately come up with an indicator of high potential and readiness to move on to the next level. So what you see here, I've basically outlined the set of competencies. These are a generic set of competencies. Morgan McCall's leadership demands here. You look across any organization in the US, I can guarantee you they're gonna look something like this. They're typically broken into those three categories, leading the business, leading the people, and character strengths and virtues. So what we need to do is identify the different data sources to give us information across each of these competencies. Now I've just mapped on uh, some, some of the uh, links here between the foundational, uh, we want uh, conceptual strategic thinking, right? What kind of firepower does the individual bring to the table? Uh, what are the, the, what's the characteristic patterns of behavior? How do they behave under stress with, with our personality inventories? Behavioral interviews. Yeah, they can be gained, but if you set them up in such a way, I want to understand the experiences that you bring to the table, and not just a checklist of those experiences. I want to know what you learned from those experiences and how we can apply that to the two to three level higher uh, target uh, that we're assessing you for. 360 feedback, we, it's an important uh, element to understand how you are seen by others on those competencies required for success at, at two to three levels higher. And then what we consider a bang for the buck here, these stretch challenges provided through the simulation. So we'll integrate the data across each of these competencies to provide rich developmental feedback on each of the competencies and then also come up with an indicator of, of hypo and, and overall uh, readiness for, for success. So this is the, the sort of under the hood, behind the scenes uh, linkage matrix. I'm sure it's not new to anyone, obviously, here. But this is how we conceptualize pulling all this data together and integrating it. <coughs> we then need to take this and apply it to the organization. So in this case, I don't know if, I hope everybody can see it. Uh, this is an integrated assessment and development matrix that's linked to key leadership transitions, targeting individuals at different career stages in the organization. And we're still looking at that, that leadership potential blueprint. We've applied job analysis to make it ours. And we have incorporated context into this whole situation. And so starting at the early career phase, we're looking to do some initial talent segmentation. Uh, we'll have a uh, situational judgment test put in there, a uh, bio data or a personality, and cognitive ability test here right at the front door, maybe a two, two and a half hour online assessment. As we move higher into the organization, looking to confirm potential, verify global talent, succession planning, We'll get deeper into the assessments, start creating those virtual assessments. We still want to understand the personality cognitive. We'll incorporate 360. Uh, and similarly, as, as we go uh, up here, then we'll link those assessment tools to development. Right? And we'll, we'll ensure that these are just a set of experiences, but there may be other developmental opportunities that are identified at each organizational level here. This represents a way to manage talent across the enterprise by ensuring that the organization is identifying and nurturing its talent early on, creating robust talent pipelines, and informing movement decisions across these career transitions. So it's a multi-method, multi-trade approach. And this represents what PepsiCo is doing right now. This is essentially their model uh, across each of these transitions. And they did a study, and I'm just giving you some highlights here on the effect of this integrated assessment program, found statistically significant relationships between the assessments and the performance ratings across all organizational levels. Uh, they found they were getting three times the number of high potentials identified who might have been missed otherwise. And currently looking at, that, at the diversity of those two, because that tells a great story. If you're identifying three times the number of individuals who would have been missed and have a great diversity narrative there, that, you know, that, that's the bottom line. 
Promotions, the highest scoring individuals were promoted at 1.5 to 2.5 times the speed of those from the lower scoring groups. The, the interesting thing for me is that the 360s, after 12 to 18 months, uh, show an average of an 88% improvement across those targeted areas for the participants. And the other nice thing is that there's a 90% um, uh, favorability rating of participation and not everybody got high potential, right? So these are individuals who've gone through this process and have actually uh, uh, maybe not gotten the best news, but they've gotten a good deal of feedback, rich feedback that they believe is, is really important for their careers. I'm gonna show you a brief little video. Uh, PepsiCo won this uh, PSYOP and SHRM uh, award and they put together a, a video explaining that and it gives you a little, brings out some of these, uh, these words here. As one of the leading food and beverage companies in the world, PepsiCo has 260,000 associates in 200 countries and territories. Therefore, our objective is to get, develop, and retain the best talent. That's the reason we created LEAD. LEAD is a very creative acronym for leadership assessment and development. It's basically an individual assessment, but what's unique about it is that those assessments vary depending on the job level. It was designed to measure PepsiCo's leadership competencies and what are the leadership competencies of the future. How we get at that is something called a multi-method, multi-trade approach, which just means that we use multiple methods to measure those competencies. It does three things for us. Number one, it provides us with information about our highest potential talent in a consistent and valid manner. Number two, it provides individuals, participants, with feedback that can help them learn and grow. And number three, it provides a company with data that can help us have informed talent management decisions and discussions. We go ahead at each level and give people four different assessments. From a foundation perspective, we measure cognitive ability and personality. To assess people on how they're doing today, we use a 360 feedback survey. To assess the dimensions of tomorrow, we use a business case simulation either online or in person. So the development process for LEAD is really unique because each tier has a really tailored approach. Um, so at the mid to senior levels of the organization, internal talent management, OD, and HR professionals work really closely with participants to craft an individual development plan. And then our team also hosts development orientations and trainings with participants and key HR stakeholders to guide and support them through the process. Our model prioritizes on the job learning, so through things like stretch assignments, but it also includes mentoring and coaching, as well as further education and training through things like our PEP University. The results of the program have been phenomenal. We're finding superstars that we might have otherwise missed and giving people the opportunity to develop skills that they wouldn't normally have had. The lead has proven that we can harness the power of our people and grow and develop our future talent. It's been great to see that. As an HR professional, as a sponsor, and as a participant, I really think uh, LEAD provides a platform for more intentionally built pipelines to more surgically work on key talent and personally help me realize my two potential. On behalf of PepsiCo, we're honored to receive the HR Impact Award. We'd like to thank our vendor, APT Metrics, who's been with us on this journey, and we'd like to thank Sherm and SIOP for this prestigious honor. Okay, so. Any questions? <coughs> Went through a lot of stuff there. Yes, sir. I had a question. Um, you showed us the matrix that you had in regards to the different assessment solutions. Mm -hmm. Do you have different profiles at each of those levels, or are you always going towards the destination profiles being the This one here? No, the other, the slide that you just had. Do so you have different ways to assess these individuals? from a success perspective, is it always the destination role that you target? Yes. Or do you do job analysis at each of these levels? Well, it's it, that's a very good question. So when we're looking to assess the team leads, our validation work occurs at the mid-level manager. Okay. So we're actually validating and developing the profiles at two to three levels higher in all cases. So you're yeah. always looking towards one or two roles above. Yes, yeah. How much do you see those vary? in regards to what you're looking at from an overall profile? Fairly significantly. 
and that's at competency level or personality level? Cognitive it's level? It's both. It, it's all, all the above. So when we do the job analysis, we look at it and go, fortunately, in, in this case, we were able to do criterion validation. So we actually were able to weight these based on performance at the different levels. And so then we would apply those weightings, uh, so for the team leads or for the two levels or three levels lower. So yeah, that's, we don't always have the luxury of doing the criterion validation study. We, we have the same problem. Yeah, yeah, and, and oftentimes um, we get stuck at, at the senior most levels and the question becomes, how do we validate the Hogan? How do we validate the Ravens? which are the, the two primary uh, uh, assessments that we use in addition to the SIM. And, uh, you know, it's, we, we, have to, we have to do the competency mapping, we have to come in and transport the validity that, that Hogan has, uh, and that's really critical. Uh, so that when we're building our technical reports describing the validity of these, because we're, these are high stakes decisions, and we have to make sure that they are nailed down um, and I've actually called Bob on occasion and, and gotten uh, advice on how to weight certain things and what to look for in certain profiles. Uh, so it's really critical, uh, you know, how God love the uniform guidelines uh, and, and they do not uh, necessarily allow content validation on uh, personality and cognitive ability tests. And as old as they are, they are still given great deference by the courts. And we're involved in a lot of litigation support work. We have to make sure that what we're doing in a proactive way uh, would, would uh, pass muster. So that's really critical for us in, in making sure we're able to transport the validity in at those senior levels. Yeah. Me? Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Sure. Oh no. Um, Here, I'll put the laser. It seems, uh, <laughs> it seems um, really challenging to think five or seven years in, in the future. Um, what do you do if it's clear that your subject matter experts are not experts? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. What do we do if the SMEs that we're talking with are not the experts? Are not individuals who can envision? Uh, what the organization might look like. And so we absolutely run into that. And, and um, if, if the organization doesn't have an organizational strategy function, and some, sometimes they don't, um, we'll oftentimes go out to uh, thought leaders in business schools uh, who study those sectors and uh, who can provide us with some general information about where the sector's headed, where the industry's headed, and how likely it would impact the organization that we're working <coughs> with. So that is sort of a proxy for uh, working with individuals who may not have a clear vision uh, forward. The other thing is if they don't, we may need to assess them as well. <laughs> yes? So how do you work with organizations who don't understand the rationale for um, kind of broadening their scope of looking at high potential to lower levels in the organization? Because I think we often get brought in where they say, this is a really high stakes group. Among this group of 12 people, pick our next CEO. But what they realize is that group of 12 people is probably maybe not the right 12 people and that they would have to go several steps down and back to actually get the right hypo pool, right? Like we're missing people if you're not looking at that pool. At right? lower levels, you mean? Yeah. yeah. So how do you like make that argument to say, yes, you need to pay attention to this group, but first you have to have gotten the right people to ascend through much lower levels in the organization. Right, right. And, and that that is something that comes just basically through presenting this chart and saying, you know, this is a fully fleshed out model that you are missing if, if you just focus on the mid-level managers and, and don't go lower because there's a lot of talent down there. Now we may be focused on the foundational dimensions and the growth dimensions more in our assessment. So we'll look at personality and, and cognitive there. Uh, and, but those are really important uh, folks that we need to look at and, and here's what a fully fleshed out model looks like. Uh, and the other thing that we do is uh, will uh, create and, or recommend to organizations, and this came from actually from legal advice, uh, that for organizations uh, who are who've engaged in sort of the nomination process by using managers, 
that we'll, we'll actually recommend an open nomination process, a self-nomination process. Now, there's criteria associated with that. You have to be enrolled um, a year, you have to be a high performer, and, and a number of criteria, but nonetheless, we let the individuals self-nominate. You might have to phase that in, depending on how large the organization is, uh, because you know, there may be like thousands at that level, and, and a phased approach is right. But that then allows for much more diversity in, in who's uh, uh, getting assessed, and uh, so that's a really critical piece of it. But specifically to your question, it's more just an education of, uh, and, and also a question around uh, retention, too, because if, if these individuals are not dealt with or, or assessed or uh, thought of in those terms, they're, they're gonna roll, right? Especially the high potential ones. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So, um, I think the argument of like, we're identifying people that we wouldn't have identified otherwise, like we're, we're finding these diamonds in the rough, we're finding hidden rock stars, I think that's compelling to people. Mm -hmm. But how do you deal with the reverse where it's like, <coughs> you didn't select the person that I think is a rock star into the potential program, where a lot of like the manager nominations and people that kind of rise to the surface, and we're like, yeah. actually, this is a whole lot of sparkle and not a lot of substance, and that's not actually potential. How do you kind of manage the other people? So, so the manager felt that they had the best yeah. idea about it. the sun I never had concept okay. there yet. Um, I mean, that, that is, that's huge. I mean, that, and particularly when you're first implementing it, that's where we see it. Um, generally after a year or so, or maybe three years, where this data starts to make sense and, and can be seen as, as something that's valuable input to them in making that decision, that's where they'll start to, to understand and then the data, they can't live without the data. But it's really at that beginning phase where, where they believe that they're gonna lose control over who they nominate and also they've got the best judgment in this scenario. So it's really, it takes some time and education uh, and, and we've found two to three years after implementation, that stuff, that noise goes away. Uh, and it, it, it's important that you're providing quality data, obviously, but. Uh, that's that's uh, what we have found anyway. Yes. So we always talk about when you introduce an objective assessment into the process, it, it increases diversity in terms of the whole of individuals. Mm -hmm. Do you all kind of capture that data and, and leverage it when you're looking at your science, to, like increase the diversity before and after? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we monitor and also adverse impact as a rule. We again, these are all decisions that are being made even in development centers. Um, and so we monitor adverse impact, but even in the but even before that, in the validation, we make sure that we have weighted these instruments in such a way uh, that that adverse impact is minimized and diversity is increased. And, and uh, you know, the Hogan's a great measure for weighting and diluting some of the adverse impact that we might find, like say, in the Ravens. Uh, and we like the Ravens because it generally has less adverse impact than some of the other cognitive tools, uh, but you're still getting your adverse impact. And, and so we're able to weight uh, the, the Hogan in such a way that, that minimizes that. And, and that plays a huge role in the implementation process. It also has great correlations. So I mean, you can weight it just based on what it's core, the fact that it's got high correlations. So, um, you know, that, that ends up, and the simulations don't have huge effect size differences either. Uh, that's another piece. You know, you, the research on SJTs shows in general that they've got less uh, effect size uh, differences and, and that carries through on the SIMs. Um, so that, that's a, also a nice thing that we're measuring these, all this range of attributes without the adverse impact. And the story is important too. The diversity story is very important. Uh, when, when you're saying, look, we found three times as many than, they, than we would have otherwise had, and by the way, half of these are women. Right? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a huge uh, a win there. Is that a common thing that you see? That um, it tends to be more women like that? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. It tends to be more women in, the, in those groups. Who'd have thunk? <laughs> right? <laughs> Other questions? Yes, so, uh, one of the slides mentioned the multi-trade, multi-method mm -hmm. approaches. Um, what other methods do you use, if you've used them, to look at personality? Um, do 
do you just use Hogan or? Well, that's what we recommend. We do stumble into organizations who are using the OPQ uh, <coughs> sometimes, but uh, you know, we talk them out of that insanity after a while. Um, but uh, uh, you know, for the most part, that uh, you know, it's 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 uh, Hogan uh, as you a person. Do you use simulations or anything to get at? Some of oh yeah, things? yeah, yeah. We'll use the simulations as a way to uh, uh, get at some of those personal characteristics as well. So we triangulate in on those. You know, when you look at some of the characteristics and the virtues in that that uh, that previous chart there, uh, we'll we'll make sure that we. Uh, get some of those variables through the simulation as well. And of course, you know, the interviews, the attempts to get at that as well, and some of the other methods. I mean, the, the idea is to have at least two measures on each competency, and hopefully three, if you can get it. How expensive are those uh, simulations to build? Um, the trailers? Uh, well, the trailers, the trailers are not that bad because you're simply pulling them from the sim. Um, you could probably figure about a hundred grand for a sim for the development and validation of that, but it's theirs. It's the it's the company's that because it's custom built. So this is your simulation now. They own it. Do you use actors? Um, it's not like built through the company with the company. No, we use professional actors and professional directors and producers all in LA. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we definitely do not scrimp on that because uh, you've seen these videos with bad acting. I mean, there's nothing worse than that. You're seeing, oh my God, I'm so distracted by the bad acting. I'm not even sure what I'm being assessed on right now. So that becomes really a critical factor in how we produce these. And the lots that we get, like that, that Children First lot, I mean, there are all these lots in, obviously in L.A., Hollywood uh, has, has uh, uh, these lots that we then go on and rent. and uh, So it's got to be as realistic as possible. And uh, some of our other clients will film um, at their locations or we'll create a studio that looks and feels like their corporate offices. Other comments? Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. So there should be uh, wine and uh, snacks down in the bistro, and you'll join us down there. Sure. And uh, so if you have other questions or, or want to talk more one-on-one -on -one with John, he'll be there. Great. Thank you.